All right. Uh, good evening, and thanks for the introduction. This is joint work uh, done with colleagues of mine at Tableau, Melanie Tori, who's actually in the audience, and Alex Jalali. So ambiguity and underspecification are prevalent in language, and humans are naturally adept at disambiguating. So hopefully we won't see this happen. But the issue of underspecificity is prevalent in computer systems. So I might be searching for the term caterpillar, and that could either mean the construction equipment company or the creepy crawly kind. And we've all probably had varied degrees of success with smart speaker devices such as Google Home or Alexa. So to address the notion of ambiguity in natural language systems, there has been several types of work um, stemming from web search, where search engines like IntelliZap has used context to help constrain what the user's intent is. So I might be in a document where I'm researching about animals and I type in Jaguar, and the system will know that I'm pertaining to the animal versus the car brand. There also have been systems in the visual analysis space, Evisa and Evision were systems uh, that we developed earlier that looked at the context of previous utterances. So I could type in a question, large earthquakes near California, and I could ask a follow-up question, how about near Texas, and the context of large earthquakes is transferred over to this follow-up utterance to disambiguate. Um, and then, Mixed initiative approaches such as using widgets to um, address ambiguity have uh, been seen in systems such as Datatone and Analyza, and also in Arco, where a user may not explicitly specify an analytical task, but the system will provide suggestions to do so. Given this prior art in natural language and ambiguity, um, these systems have explored specific use cases whether it's just filtering in systems like Evisa and Evision, or specific ways of disambiguating portions of the analytical workflow. So our work was looking at expanding that notion of ambiguity and underspecified utterances in terms of more holistic analytical workflow. So in this paper, we focus on enhancing the notion of inferencing by introducing a, an intermediate language that we call ArcLang for mapping underspecified utterances to fully formed queries. And we do that by inferring data attributes, values, and analytical expressions to fill in the missing information. And in order to figure out what the, that missing information is, we use a notion of a relevancy metric and like a lot of the prior systems, we adopt a mixed initiative approach for users to be able to repair and refine these system choices. And we follow this up with an evaluation where we actually deployed the system and we assess the quality of the inferencing with, uh, with the users using a survey. So in the interest of time, I will briefly focus on these highlighted items and more details can be found in the paper. So let me start by giving you an overview of the system, walking through the different components of the system, starting from the input utterance all the way to the visualization. So the input utterance, show me the sales over time, is first tokenized into these n-gram tokens. And then there's a lexical translation that's performed to map these tokens to concepts and data attributes. And we employ a parsing algorithm based on a set of grammar rules to resolve the lexicons into analytical expressions. And in order to help with the inferencing for any missing information while resolving them, we make use of a semantic model that has the metadata of the data source to resolve the metadata for these data attributes in order to do a sensible inferencing. We then validate these expressions based on their semantic and syntactic correctness. And we execute these utterances in VizQL, which is a visual language query in Tableau for generating a visualization. And if you're interested, there are details about VizQL in this reference that I provide here. 
So the premise of being able to infer expressions and mapping these underspecified utterances into fully qualified ones happens through this intermediate language that I mentioned called ArcLang. So why do we introduce this intermediate language? So conventional query languages such as SQL are powerful from a mathematical perspective, but they are often not conducive for natural language type systems because natural language utterances tend to be more colloquial and tend to be underspecified. And we could go about having a more dynamic probabilistic grammar approach where we generate rules based on what people type, but we found that this sort of grammar generation tends to be brittle and it's not easily scalable to any sort of data source. Hence, we use this intermediate ArcLang language, which basically transforms natural language utterances into VizQL queries. It has a known syntactic and semantic form, very similar to words in human language, and translates that to a known sentence structure as you know, typical human languages might be. And the words that comprise ArcLang consist of attributes, values, and concepts. So let me walk you through some of the functions that ArcLang supports. Um, there's a lot of nuances around the constraints that govern the language, and we have um, a lot of that detail in the paper. So ArcLang supports five types of analytical expressions. The first one is an aggregation expression. So in this example, it's sum of price, which basically takes multiple rows and groups them together um, with an aggregation function, such as average, mean, median, and so forth. And we also have group expressions, such as by country, which partitions the data into categories. We support filter expressions, such as in France, that returns a subset of the field's domain, we support various forms of numerical and categorical filters. We also support limits, which is a form of a filter, but essentially returns values up to n rows. So in this case, top five wineries or bottom 10 wineries and so forth. And finally, sort expressions, such as sort wineries, arranging data in a particular order, either alphabetically ascending or descending. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause and actually show you a demo of the system and walk you through some examples of how we actually infer um, underspecified utterances, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail after the demo. So this is our system. It's actually deployed right now in Tableau on server and online, and it works with a published data source. It consists of a data pane, which provides a preview of the different attributes in the data source, along with some synonyms that the user might have entered, a description of the attribute, some of the top values that might be present, indicating what are some of the things someone can ask. And we also have some suggestions that uh, we provide to the user. So let me start off. And I just wanted to point out this is a data source of wines. Uh, most of our team, and you know, we, we are focused in California, so it's either earthquakes or wines, and we'd already used earthquakes in past systems, so we decided to pick a more happier data set. Um, yeah, because a lot of people ask us, like, why wines? So I just wanted to put it out there. Okay, so I can type in average price over time, and if you notice here, my intent is a line chart, but I don't specify a date or a date-time attribute. And the system infers vintage, which is actually a date attribute. So I can click on it and get a line chart. We, I can also further refine that, and I can say in California. Another example is 2015 wineries, and this is also under specified because I am specifying a particular date value, but again, I'm not specifying the attribute, so I can pick this, and I get all the wineries sorted in descending order with vintage set to the year 2015. 
I can type in top wineries. And if you notice here, the system um, infers a numerical attribute, which we call a measure in Tableau, um, using sum of number of records. And this is something that we infer because of the constraints of the underlying system. We can't generate a sensible visualization without the measure involved. We see a similar phenomenon with sort. So I could say sort wineries by biggest. And it shows me uh, the wineries that are sorted in descending order. Another thing that we've noticed uh, with users using the system is they tend to directly refer to a particular viz that they would like to see as a response or indirectly allude to it. So I could type in list tasters because tasters are, is a category here. And the system will infer that I'm referring to a text table and show me a text table of taster names. And I can also change it to something else if I want to. I can say country as a pie, get a pie chart. And similar to the other example, it infers a measure, in this case, sum of number of records, and generates a pie chart. Some of the more indirect references to visas are like this. So I could say correlate points with price. And correlation can be best represented using a scatter plot. And I've only specified one numerical attribute, so the system will infer another one and generate a scatter plot. Since tree maps tend to be photogenic on a big screen, I am just going to put this in for kicks. So another thing that we also support is the notion of these concepts, such as most expensive wineries. And it maps expensive to price and shows me a visualization. We also have these vague concepts. So I could say wineries with high points. And high is any sort of range. And it, the system infers that range using the metadata from points. And I can go in here and look at the range. In this case, it's, a st it's one standard deviation from the mean. And I can go and override that if I need to. So that's um, a brief overview of the demo. And let me go back to my presentation. So let's talk a little bit about the inferencing algorithm. So to handle under specification, we support two forms of inferencing. One is called the intraphrasal uh, inferencing, which handles under specification within each analytical expression. So I have an example here, countries with rank 1, 3. The attributes are country and rank. And the values here are 1 and 3 associated with the attribute rank. Walking through the grammar, country is identified as a group expression where the group operator by is inferred. And there's also a filter expression where between is missing. But because we have two values here, it'll infer between and then combine that to an expression like this. The second form of inferencing we support is what we call interphrasal inferencing that un addresses under specification between analytical expressions. And this is because of the constraints of this QL, but also to improve the analytical usefulness of the visualizations themselves. So an example here, sales throughout July 2016. And here, for July 2016, the attribute on which to filter to is missing. So this is the intraphrasal example that I talked about. But in order to generate a visualization, we need this attribute to also be grouped, because we can't just have a bare filter expression. But we do something that improves just a generic group. In order to generate this line chart, we look at the date aggregation level in the filter, which is month because of July. And we infer one level below in terms of the date aggregation hierarchy, which is week, in order to generate a line chart. 
And as seen in the demo, we also infer visualizations based on user intent. So this example, life expectancy by location, a geographic field country is inferred to show a map. And to show a scatter plot to view a correlation, the system infers a numerical attribute, life expectancy. And you might ask, how do we actually find the attribute to infer? We use a notion of popularity data. So we look at how often an attribute was used in Tableau workbooks that um, consume this data source, along with some usage data to figure out what might be the most probable attribute to infer. And then, as I mentioned, for these vague concepts such as low, high, cheap, and expensive, we come up with a sensible numerical range based on the underlying metadata, but the user can always repair and refine that using ambiguity widgets. So how did we test the system to see how it was doing? We deployed our system over a two-month period. We actively collected feedback and iterated on our algorithm. And the algorithm evolved considerably as users tried real-world examples, identifying gaps and limitations in the system. We had 205 unique users and over 6,000 visualizations that were generated as responses. And we conducted a survey to sort of gauge the sense and the quality of the inferencing. So we basically curated a bunch of queries from this two-month deployment um, manually found the most expected response and asked users to rate them on a Likert scale with dark orange being very poor and dark blue very good. And as you can see, the results were pretty positive. But we had some limitations in the system. For example, we came up with this notion of just using popularity data to infer a missing attribute, for example but we were not really looking at the semantics of the utterance in order to come up with something sensible. So for example, top five wines by variety, we were inferring number of records, um, but users actually preferred points because they said, you know, when I rate something, particularly wines, I'm looking at it from points and not by just the number of records in the data source. Um, another place that we would like to continuously improve the algorithm is having more personalization based on how people use the data source and the questions they ask. And currently, we're looking at using context from previous utterances and the visualization to support more conversational behavior and figuring out how to infer underspecified information. So we have this currently out um, in Tableau. So it's uh, being used by people as of now. So if you, if you use Tableau, um, you're more than welcome to try it. And with that, I would like to thank you for coming to the talk. Um, I have some links here to the feature itself, um, some projects that we have on Tableau Research and the paper. And there's a shameless plug there um, indicating that we're hiring um, research scientists, interns, engineers, and even user researchers. So happy to take any questions. Presentation. Any questions? Hello. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I am wondering if you noticed any differences between like uh, user background. So if there are people who are frequent database users, they can be more familiar with the terminology. Whereas people, those who are not, who are first time users or novices, they may be totally off the track. And how do you kind of address that in the algorithm yes. if you do? That's a great question. So if you've noticed with the system, you know, the, the suggestions that are returned are not very colloquial. They're, they feel still a little SQL-like. And that's something we're aware of. And there is a learning curve. People need to understand the types of functions and operators they have to use. But they tend to pick up on that over time and get better. That being said, there's room, a lot of room for improvement. So we're looking at ways in, it's a, sort of a chicken and the egg problem. Without releasing it in the wild, we don't have data in terms of how people ask questions. So we have to start somewhere. But we are actively collecting information in terms of how people express their questions. And hopefully, that will manifest as actual suggestions in the system. Yes. 
Related to the last point, yes. uh, in, in a way, you are at the same time you're collecting data to train the system, you're also training your users or training your test users to say stuff that the system now understands. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do you break out of this loop? That's a great question. Yes, um, as, as with any device, I mean, we have a specific way of interacting with Siri or Alexa, and we kind of get tuned to that. Um, and I don't quite know the answer to that because we have users who are probably going to continue, I mean, they have been using this feature for a while now, you know, months or even to a year. So for them, being able to switch and being able to ask something will be harder. Um, I think that's something that I'd be interested in looking at. And Melanie, uh, my colleague in particular, um, spends a lot of time working with users to figure out what those friction points are. But I think the short answer to that is my hypothesis is once we put out actual suggestions and we show suggestions that are, feel less canonical and they're more colloquial, people might be able to learn or adapt to that. But that is something we have to see. It's just a hypothesis. Yeah, that too, yeah. And how do you intend to use context uh, in the interactions, uh, uh, the interaction uh, that uh, uh, you have with the users? So uh, do you have uh, any ideas about that? Uh, you mentioned that uh, you will, uh, it is one, probably one of your future work uh, for uh, improvement. For con you mean conversation? Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, so kind of the next evolution of this system is around conversation, sort of pulling from the earlier work that we worked on around Evisa where we use context uh, from the previous utterance to fill in gaps. Um, so that's something we're actively looking into. Um, and there's some, inter some interesting problems there, um, especially around being able to swap attributes. You might have something and you like replace this with this, or I want to change this to something. So you see kind of new types of interaction patterns when we start enabling more conversations. Also, also for this, this ambiguation could be Correct. useful for that. Yeah. Any other questions? So uh, does the system offer alternatives? So if like based on these inferences, so if for example, for the case of location, if they actually want to map might not be a good visualization for seeing how things compare if they want to compare. How does the system deal with that kind of problem? When you mean comparing versus just showing a single Yeah, visit? even though it's still by location, but the, the, the goal of the user is not an overview, is to compare. Right. We don't have uh, comparatives or small multiples enabled right now, but that is something that has come up through feedback. So once we do, I think the plan is to support both options and looking at usage behavior. If people prefer one over the other, we can rank that to be higher. Thank you again for your, uh, just, okay. Uh, it's okay. I'll be around, um, so feel free to come by and ask me questions as well. So thank you. Thank you again. For